As a matter of course, I need to start by telling how um, thankful I am for being invited to take part in this conference. So I thank very much indeed to the organizers. And um, um, as all of you sharing this fascinating uh, papers and conversations um, that sometimes uh, make us uh, feel dizzy uh, in the best sense of, of, of the word, of course, because um, actually if you don't get confused, you don't get into the pleasure. Se você não confunde, você não goza. So I think that uh, I'm going to add up a little more confusion to our conversations and this is going to be my main aim. Okay. Um, since the main theme of this section is uh, technology, I would like to start by taking as the frame of my presentation the great technological and cognitive revolution capitalized by the Second World War. As well uh, as is well known, wars tend to accelerate and even intensify processes of technological changes in general. But the Second World War was particularly characterized as never before in history by a arms <coughs> race that culminated in the development of new technologies. For instance, um, the uh, <coughs> nuclear weapons that put an end to it only to start another yet more aggressive arms race in the context of the succeeding Cold War. And just because the nuclear weapons had such a harrowing effect upon people's imagination, epitomizing the horrors of the war, as well as pointing to the impending threats of the Cold War that was already looming in the horizon, we tend sometimes to forget the wide range and profound impact of the many technological transformations brought forth by the war effort, which gave birth to an entire new world right after the end of the hostilities. So I would like, uh, uh, I'd like to uh, begin by commenting briefly on some of these crucial transformations. Um, First of all, beginning with uh, this gentleman, uh, Norbert Wiener. Um, his father was uh, a German immigrant who eventually became a professor of Slavistics at Harvard University. Um, but little Norbert uh, proved very early on in his life to be a mathematical genius. He was so incredibly brilliant that he got his PhD in advanced mathematics at Harvard at the age of 18 years old. I'll repeat that. <laughs> he got his PhD in advanced mathematics yeah, at the age of 18 years, years old. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, that's the kind of man he was. Um, but that's a problem uh, more than anything else because, as you know, um, universities are very conservative institutions. We know it because we are part of it. Um, and universities don't like brilliant people, especially very brilliant people. <laughs> because very brilliant people tend to destabilize the fields. And by destabilizing the fields, they destabilize the careers. And people don't like it. Um, that's the reason why, as soon as uh, dear uh, Norbert Wiener got his PhD, uh, people from his department and other adjacent departments got as much money in the form of grants as they could to give, them all, uh, to give him all that money with the single condition that he would take it and go as far away from Harvard <laughs> and the United States as possible and to stay away for at least 10 years, <laughs> not to return, until people forget about him. <laughs> and so he did. Uh, see, he took the money, went to... Um, Britain, studied with some of the most brilliant um, mathematicians <coughs> of the time, and, and then went to Germany, studied there with some of the most uh, brilliant German mathematicians. And uh, after that, 10 years after, he returned to the United States unemployed. The universities didn't want to hear about him anymore. So um, that was the situation until something very tragic uh, happened. The Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. 
and it brought the United States uh, all of a sudden in a lot of trouble because uh, now the enemy uh, was the Japanese Empire. Uh, but since the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor, the uh, most important military naval um, base of the United States in the uh, South Atlantic, the Americans um, could only approach Japan by making use of their fleet. But their fleet was therefore very much exposed to the Japanese Zeros, the Japanese um, uh, fighting airplanes, which were a technological prodi uh, prodigy. It was very small, very light, uh, very maneuverable, so much so that it was almost impossible for an artillery man uh, to catch a <coughs> flying uh, Japanese Zero uh, by making use of uh, anti-aircraft cannons the way they existed by then. Um, it was a big problem because um, if they couldn't catch the Zeros, the Zeros were going to destroy the uh, American naval fleet. And therefore, um, very quickly, the Japanese will be coming over the western coast of the United States and will threaten to invade the United States. So it was an incredible danger for this country in a way that it had never faced before. Um, and it is only in moments like this that the uh, American authorities remember that they have the best universities in the world. And that all <laughs> the universities, uh, going for the universities, they started asking, who is the best person to solve this problem as soon as possible in the most effective way? And then, very much against everybody's will, they will have to concede, well, bloody Norbert Wiener. Uh, <laughs> and so they contacted the man, and very quickly, Norbert Wiener uh, solved the problem uh, with an incredible solution. Uh, he adapted sensors, uh, sound and light sensors, to the um, anti-aircraft uh, cannon, so that uh, whenever a Japanese Zero would uh, show up, at the horizon, the sensors would lock into it and will follow it and will start processing uh, calculations about it. Um, what was uh, the size of it, what was the speed of it, what was the direction of it, what was the speed of the wind, and those calculations uh, were processed and transformed in information uh, by means of uh, mathematical uh, algorithms that were passed into the uh, machinery of the uh, anti-aircraft uh, equipment. So much so that uh, whenever the Japanese Zero would come at the range, uh, at the short range of the uh, anti-aircraft cannon, it would uh, immediately <coughs> start shooting. And from that point on, no Japanese Zero would ever, ever have any chance against the uh, American artillery. Uh, it inverted completely uh, the uh, process of the war. From that point on, the Americans uh, became the aggressors and the Japanese started losing the, uh, their aircraft and their air power to the, point, to the point that they had to resume to the only tactics that they could use that was throwing the already shot airplanes ag against the uh, American ships uh, as kamikaze. Uh, the only remaining tactics, which is um, heroic, but in military terms, very ineffective. Um, so, Norbert Wiener understood that uh, that system was so effective because it didn't have the participation or interference of any human being. There was no human being implied in, uh, in, in, into its uh, operation. And that's the reason why it was so effective. So there was a problem about human beings. Now you are capable of conceiving of machines that uh, perform better certain tasks than human beings themselves. And he understood that after the war, that system would obviously be used for other purposes, especially for um, industrial production. And industrial production, uh, it will set a process of automation 
that would make uh, most working men and working women redundant because you can't compete with machinery. Human beings cannot compete with machinery. Um, so therefore, in uh, the book, well, he systematized this new field of knowledge of automation, of self-organized system, um, which he named cybernetics, according to the Greek word kybernetos, meaning uh, uh, the conductor of a vessel. Uh, so implying the idea of equipment uh, that are capable of conducting themselves, of governing themselves, of organizing themselves. Uh, when he systematized uh, this new field of knowledge and named it uh, cybernetics, in the same book uh, he had an extra chapter where he discussed uh, the possible um, consequences in terms of uh, the impact that uh, it would necessarily have upon the uh, organization of the working force. And he said, um, provisions must be taken so that uh, it is not going to uh, make things even worse than they are already were, but the, the states were uh, you know, uh, just living uh, the depression years. And in that sense, uh, he was very concerned that uh, it could perhaps uh, increase uh, social inequality and uh, social oppression. Um, that chapter was so disturbing that uh, there were pressures from directly from the State Department and the next edition of the book, that chapter was suppressed. Nowadays, it's just about cybernetics, uh, not its social consequences anymore. Um, the other uh, character I would uh, like to bring to our conversation is Alan Turing. They were the three great mathematicians uh, of the second part of the 20th century. Norbert Wiener, um, uh, the British, uh, Alan Turing, and uh, the American Claude Shannon. Uh, more on Claude, on Claude Shannon uh, in a second. Uh, Alan Turing uh, was also a genius, and he did what was thought as being impossible. He broke the German code. Uh, the scientists at the time thought that the, the German code was absolutely unbreakable. But he created a, a machine, uh, he called it the Enigma machine, uh, that through a process of uh, computing patterns and analy analyzing and operating with these patterns, uh, could come to uh, a final translation of the German code. And then uh, all the German communication was completely transparent to the Allies. And it was crucial for the um, victory of the Allies. Because uh, by now, I think we can already say these things, uh, because in technological terms, in all areas that you can look at, the Germans were far more advanced than the Allies. So it is people like uh, Norman Wiener and Alan Turing that turn it uh, the other way around. Um, but what is incredibly interesting about uh, Alan Turing, about, apart from uh, the Enigma machine, uh, was the last article that he wrote before dying. Um, as you know, uh, he died very, very young. Um, he was uh, an open, uh, assumed homosexual. And uh, right after the war, being the greatest hero that Britain had in that war, uh, the British authorities decided uh, to persecute him for being a homosexual. And uh, uh, having to face a humiliating uh, imposition of uh, chemical uh, castration, he decided to take his own life. He committed suicide. But he wrote this very last article that changed everything in science. Uh, it's, it was called morphogenesis. And uh, the idea is to understand how uh, we could move our understanding from electronic self-organizing systems into the biological complexities of embryogenesis. Um, to put it <coughs> more clearly, he wanted to know how complex patterns could 
come into being by following simple rules. Or, to put it even more simple, how does a seed know how to build a flower? Then, Claude Shannon. He is the father of, of what's now called information theory. Um, he uh, used to build automated machines that could recognize patterns in audio signals and uh, numerical sequences. He worked for ITT laboratories during the war. And so <coughs> this is the basis of his um, seminal book, The Mathematical Theory of Communications. Um, a book so complex that we can only understand it because of the introduction that uh, Warren Weaver wrote to it. That's the that was the only uh, uh, reason why I could at least understand <laughs> what's in the book. Uh, more on Warren Weaver uh, in a second. Um, what um, Claude Shannon with uh, uh, with his theory of communication, it's mathematical theory of communication, is the understanding of um, self-organizing open-ended systems that um, were directed to a principle of homeostasis, of adjusting themselves with the external environment. Uh, this is going to be the basis uh, to the creation uh, later on of what is being called the pandemonium model. Um, which is based in the idea of millions of micro-calculations of autonomous, spontaneous agents that multiply information uh, in a feedback loop that goes all the way uh, from the bottom up, uh, funneling from the bottom up into a final stage of equilibrium within external environment that we uh, then call homeostasis. So what we have here uh, is the very opposite of the model that scientists used uh, until that point, until that moment. Um, science were uh, mostly uh, arranged to the model that we uh, could, call, could call the godlike system that um, is very centralized, vertical, hierarchical and operating from the top down. Um, then we have Warren Weaver. Uh, Warren Weaver, uh, as opposed to these other three men, was written in mathematics, but he was not a mathematician. He was a natural scientist. He was uh, a, bi a biologist. And so he was interested in understanding systems of organized complexity um, in living organisms, to, stud to study living organisms as systems of organized complexity. Um, exactly according to that idea of uh, morphogenesis that was uh, first uh, introduced by Alan Turing. He was the man, actually, who started and systematized uh, this study of complex systems. Um, and he said, uh, quotation, the great central concerns of the biologist are now not only being approached from above, but also by underneath, by the quantitative analyst who measures the underlying facts. What changed here, and you, I think you can understand this, is that now this is a task that was impossible before the invention of uh, machines capable of processing millions of calculations in a fraction of a second. That's what we have now. We didn't have that before. So from now on, we can do what we couldn't do before, starting from the bottom up. Uh, This brings us to Elia Prigozhin, um, a, Russia, a Russian physicist uh, who worked in the States, uh, in Britain, and uh, later on in Belgium. 
um, his area of interest was the study of non-equilibrium thermodynamics, which might sound kind of strange, uh, but uh, it is about the thermodynamic uh, of fluid systems. Um, the idea for him uh, was to find environments where the laws of entropy, as defined by classical physics, are temporarily overcome and another high level order may spontaneously emerge out of the underlying chaos. Um, so once again, the way to get into this understanding was by studying uh, simultaneously millions and millions of coordinated micro agents or micro actions or micro configurations that we might, for instance, call fractals. Uh, and the way that by which these uh, microstructures will define the uh, entire system. And then we have the American engineer, architect, designer, system terrorist, and crazy man uh, <laughs> called <laughs> Bookminster Seller. Uh, he uh, was uh, completely out of his mind um, because he um, started using as uh, the basis for his uh, design of new structures and equipments a field of mathematics that I don't know how familiar you are with that is called um, topology mathematics. That is the study of um, spaces that are non three dimensional um, Our brains, um, for peculiar reasons, are kind of enclosed in the three-dimensional space. That's the only thing that we can understand directly. Uh, to understand um, a space with four, five, six, 12, 35, 449, six million uh, dimensions is incomprehensible to the human brain. You cannot do it. You cannot understand it. But this was exactly the field that became crucial for new areas of knowledge, for instance, as quantum physics or uh, molecular biology, or for that matter, for the designing of computing models. And he started using these models uh, to design uh, new structures that would, he would give funny names to. Uh, geodesic domes, biospheres, diomaxion structures, synergetics. Um, he was essentially creating a geometry of thinking topology. And he would come with structures that uh, would make architecture incredibly easy using very cheap light material. Uh, that you could uh, engage with, with very little labor, and produce things incredibly complex uh, with uh, a multiplicity of possibilities of use, a multifunctionality, an open and movable architecture. Um, and you could, could use it for anything, to create uh, public spaces, to create theaters, to create arenas, to create playgrounds, to create um, uh, areas for scientific congresses, <coughs> anything, anywhere, at no cost at all. That's a revolution in architecture. That's a revolution in urbanism. That's a revolution in thinking the cities. Uh, utopia or oblivion. The world has changed. And either we change with it or we are not uh, taking the best opportunity uh, of putting these new potentials to good use, to social use, to a new cultural environment. Then, of course, uh, just to add up, we have um, Marshall McLuhan, um, the man who uh, understood that the emerging electronic environment as uh, substituting for the very visual culture inherited by the Gutenberg press 
and the Renaissance Global Village. So this is a, a, a new, understand? Go, go, go. We shoot yeah, the yeah. little thing. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Uh, funny men as well. And then we <coughs> co come to Rachel Carson, uh, who again was a natural scientist, a biologist. Uh, her main interest were uh, the oceans, and uh, she was the first to study the ocean, uh, consider it as a whole integrated complex system in itself. And then she applied that understanding of the ocean to the understanding of the Earth as well. Um, in her seminal book, Silent Spring. She was a scientific writer for the New Yorker, and all of her books uh, were first uh, presented as articles in the New Yorker, so she had a huge audience. She was the best uh, scientific communicator of her age. And uh, when Silent Spring came, it was an earthquake uh, in terms of the um, public debate that it generated. Because what she was saying there was that uh, as a consequence of the Second World War, the United States had developed um, what was by then called the biological warfare. Um, we don't know much about it in general, but the fact is the the Department of the State coordinated the production of massive quantities of toxins and poisons that were designed to destroy the crops in the east of Asia, uh, to destroy all agricultural production, to kill all anim animals as part of the war effort. Um, when the war ended, lots of these chemicals were uh, stocked. And the um, corporations didn't, didn't know what to do with it. And then they came with this nice idea. Well, let's dilute them a little bit and use them as herbicides, insecticides, or to produce uh, prophylactic substances that people will use in their household uh, or to clean themselves. Let's create a new uh, culture of cleanliness that will essentially depend on these uh, very toxic, poisonous uh, substances, and they will sell out. And they did. Uh, so <laughs> Rachel Carson was the whistleblower. So she, she was uh, fought tremendously by the uh, industry that was directly connected to it. Um, and, and there was uh, pressures to uh, uh, prohibit the book from being published, and then uh, prohibit uh, uh, Rachel Carson to participate in public debates uh, about the book and so on and so forth. But it changed everything because she demonstrated that uh, you cannot uh, enclose uh, chemical toxins in a single space, as the farmers said that they were doing. Because if you poison a single area, that poison will percolate to the water sources. It's going to get into the rivers, it's going to get into the lakes, and then the uh, vegetation will grow from it, and the insects uh, will feed on it, and then the birds will feed on the insects, and then the uh, little mammals, and then the big mammals, and then all the other animals that we uh, take as our foodstuff. And eventually all that poison, all those, those toxins will end up uh, in us, in our children, in our world. That's how it works. So everything is connected. And the only way to think about the world in the terms of this new technology, is thinking global. And then Edward Wilson, again, a natural scientist. Um, he was, uh, his field of specialization was entomology. Uh, that means the study of insects. And his main interests were ants and ants colonies. Um, and he started studying them as uh, not single creatures that live it collectively, but the entire colony as a single creature. Uh, in that sense, he created a new area of study that uh, was first 
called social biology, <coughs> and then it evolved into something even more complex called social environmentalism. And his idea was, again, to understand the systems as self-organized systems that tended by a process of feedback loop uh, to accumulate information that would uh, be funneled up to a state of homeostasis and equilibrium with the external environment. Um, and in that sense, uh, what he was trying to understand uh, was a new com concept that he named you sociality. Uh, these in states of interaction and symbiosis between creatures that, according to him, were the real key to the survival on this planet. Um, forget about the language that we have to talk about ants. Um, the idea that we have that there is a queen and there are soldiers and there are uh, workers. Nothing of that happens in the ant colony. Everybody is equal. Any single ant can, if, if he or she, detect that something is going on in the environment. She sends a, a pheromone, a, a chemical information, that will reconfigure the entire colony <coughs> in an instant. And so uh, the colony is a variable, uh, very uh, uh, alive and um, morphic system that can change all of the time according to the change in the external environment. And it brings us to, uh, oh, no, not yet. to um, Janie Jacobs, uh, about whom there were discussions with Mariana Cavalcanti and Alison Eisenberg uh, uh, yesterday. And um, Janie Jacobs uh, was herself um, very open in confirming that uh, she took the inspiration from Warring River um, and the um, uh, pandemonium uh, model of thinking to write her book, uh, The Life and Death of Great American Cities. Um, she was trying to see cities and urbanism as self-organized complex systems that operated through the pandemonium model. And um, in that sense, for her, the health of the city, the, the theme that we are going to be discussing tomorrow, um, should be measured at street level, at neighborhood level, um, not at the top, uh, according to uh, the designs of the planners or the urban planners or the um, city authorities. And that's the reason why she engaged uh, in a fight <coughs> against the mayor of New York, Robert Moses, that was trying to destroy the neighborhood where she lived um, in Lower Manhattan. Uh, mayor Moses was proposing a system that uh, would transform Lower Manhattan in a huge um, complex system of um, high-speed expressways and viaducts that will uh, revert the entire traffic of New York, um, spreading it to the bridges and to the uh, places around Manhattan, um, the state, and uh, the American territory. This is uh, basically the idea that uh, Robert Moses had uh, for the uh, reurbanization of the village area. And for that reason, she became prominent uh, as someone that represented uh, the, 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 the public fight against this conception uh, that puts the centrality of reason as uh, the main form of uh, political action uh, in this new context. Um, the idea that uh, traffic should be put before people uh, and that uh, all ultimate concern should point to uh, economic development. She was thinking more in terms of well-being, the quality of public life, the interactivity of urban space, 
in, uh, essentially about human and cultural growth. Uh, this is the plan of Mayor Moses. And as you know, uh, Mayor Moses was called the emperor of New York. And here uh, you see uh, Jenny Jacobs and Susan Sontag in prison, uh, in jail, uh, uh, along with some other uh, neighbors and citizens engaged in the fight. All, uh, all these scientists interacted with many others to consolidate a new scientific paradigm, pa paradigm a science of emergence, uh, or as they are called nowadays, emergency studies, a new cognitive turning point in what was by now not just Western culture, but an emerging globalized culture. This is the cutting edge of today's epistemological horizon. But in many senses, what could have become a political and cultural revolution based in this new scientific paradigm didn't materialize. Actually, it has been aborted since very early on. Um, and I would like to uh, demonstrate it talking about Brazil now. Brazil. Um, <laughs> The 1950s and 1960s, the, the period uh, right after the Second World War, uh, was marked by the climax of the populist uh, governments in Brazil. And there were three leaders that were fighting between themselves to become uh, the president and the quintessential um, po po populist leader that would uh, lead Brazil into uh, modernization and into I integration in the global system. They were Juscelino Kubitschek from Minas Gerais, Jânio Quadros from Sao Paulo, and um, Carlos Lacerda from Rio de Janeiro. I didn't bother to show their faces. So <laughs> they're, they're, they're not uh, that cool. Um, and, and how was it that they promoted their propaganda, uh, their platform, by urban reforms? Uh, how could they do it, uh, urban reforms being so uh, expensive as they, uh, as they were? Well, because it was now the context of the Cold War, and uh, the United States was very much concerned with the instability of Latin America, mostly after the Cuban Revolution. The circumstances prevailing in Cuba were very much the same circumstances all over Latin America. So that uh, the Americans decided that they had to give a push to the conservative side so that uh, they would be able to somehow stabilize the governments even if they had to do it by force. So they created a policy that was called Alliance for Progress and started uh, stuffing uh, lots of money uh, in the hands of the local governments. And uh, this is the money that basically financed all this uh, amazing uh, urban reconfigurations during the 1950s and 60s, uh, starting with Juscelino Kubitschek himself uh, creating the Parque da Pampulha in um, Belo Horizonte, the capital city of uh, the state of Minas Gerais. Uh, was this modernist architecture, uh, a style very much inspired by uh, Le Corbusier, but uh, readapted uh, uh, by Nehemiah to a more tropical-like kind of feature. Um, the, the polemic church of St. Francis of Assis. Um, and this is Sao Paulo, Parque Ibirapuera. You see, it, it's exactly the same kind of architecture, the same people. Uh, it is always Niemeyer, Lucio Costa, uh, Burle Marx, the same people being financed by a different populist to do the same thing in different places. Uh, now it is Sao Paulo, Parque Ibirapuera, at the very heart of the city. Um, this is an aerial view of Sao Paulo, uh, with that uh, fly saucer uh, at the very heart of the park. Very modern. Uh, and then uh, the Hotel de Flamengo, uh, or park, uh, the Flamengo Park, uh, as it is called.
called as well. Incredibly beautiful, um, all those gardens in the, the very uh, center of the garden, the, the Museum of Modern Art. All of them had, had museums of modern art at the very center of the urban project, except Sao Paulo, because Sao Paulo being Sao Paulo, it had to do, it, it had to have two museums instead of just one. One of modern art and another one of contemporary art, of course. Um, by the way, all of these museums, uh, they, they, they uh, received their collections of modern and contemporary art uh, straight from the mayor of uh, New York, uh, Nelson Rockefeller himself, in person, coming from his personal collection. Um, because he was, uh, as you know, uh, working for the State Department. <coughs> so the history of modernism in Latin America is very much uh, associated with this uh, Alliance for the Progress uh, policy of the Cold War. Well, uh, let's concentrate our interest in Rio de Janeiro. This is all. And then, uh, La Seda didn't want just to introduce this new architecture. He wanted to reshape the city completely. The idea was his rival. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, no, no. OK. 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 But I was very sweet. Okay. Um, so what, what he wanted, um, um, his rival, Jusilino Kubitschek, uh, was creating uh, what he was promoting as the new capital, Brasilia. So he wanted to transform uh, Rio de Janeiro, the old capital, in what he called the beautiful capital. So it was the new cap, uh, uh, Nova Cap, Brazilian, and a Bella Cap, the beautiful cap, Rio de Janeiro. And so he started this process of uh, what we might call uh, urban cosmetic surgery, uh, <laughs> a process of sanitation, uh, of urban cleansing, that was also a process of social cleansing. And he started removing all the favelas that were, were the ugly part, the, the ugly part of the city. Right. Uh, how? how uh, right. Um, as um, a part of this process, he started this removal of these people from the central, these poor people that live in, in the slums, mm -hmm. and uh, um, in the process, lots of people became homeless uh, and spread all over the city. And then uh, the administration started getting rid of these people as well, just by killing them and throwing them to the river. <laughs> Simple as that. Um, okay. Uh, not talking about the devil anymore. Uh, let's talk about Mario Pedrosa, who became the most important art critic and uh, the greatest <coughs> public intellectual in Brazil in the second part of the 20th century. Uh, he was a political activist, uh, very much into what we call um, radical democracy or um, social democracy, not according to the German model, but according to the model, well, I don't have the time to explain it, but uh, the model of Red Vienna. Uh, Vienna was a little republic in after the, the, the end of the First World War until the Nazi invasion uh, by the annexation of Austria in 1936. So during that period, Vienna became a very little republic that uh, promoted the most extraordinary and less known political democratic experience of the 20th century. He was um, in tune with that kind of idea. Um, so. Because he studied in Germany uh, with uh, the Gestalt uh, thinkers, he got into the Gestalt philosophy. Don't have the time to explain it. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I myself in this problem now. Um, um, his idea, his aesthetic idea was um, external senses, external sensations and emotions. Um, they strike into our imagination what he called uh, primary forms or primary images or simply symbolic forms. And these forms uh, are the ones that precede uh, speech, that precede rational thinking, that precede 
the crystallization of knowledge. So what he thought was that uh, the role of <coughs> the artists and the artwork was to tap into those symbolic forms and break them directly into the cognitive revolution that was going on and that he was very informed about so that uh, artists will somehow be the ones who will destroy all the barriers, all the walls, all the fences that were preventing people from tapping directly into the new potentials of this cognitive revolution to bring it to uh, new and uh, in inimaginable possibilities of a new life in this planet based on the idea of direct democracy. Um, because of that, of that, he became the most important art critic and he got involved with uh, a generation of young artists, uh, got involved in uh, political activism as well. Uh, as you see, the sort of art that he was interested in uh, was the art uh, connected to the idea of topology, mathematical topology. Wrote more than 40 books, the artist, the new generation. And then uh, it, it came to the point when he met Nis da Silveira. Uh, Nis da Silveira uh, was a psychiatrist uh, and also a political activist. And because of that, he was put in prison during the uh, Getulio Vargas dictatorship. So she came to know very intimately the penitentiary system. When she left the penitentiary, she understood that the model into which psychiatric institutions were formulated was exactly the same model of the penitentiary system. So that he, she wanted to transform completely uh, the idea of this prisoner uh, model of psychiatry. And for that reason, she created an, uh, a clinic of her own. She didn't call it a clinic. She called it a free territory, the house of the palms. Um, she was very uh, strongly connected to Jung. And in this house, this house uh, of palms, she would receive any kind of people. Anybody who wants to come would be uh, welcome. And anybody who, who wants to leave was we welcome to leave. You, there were no interns. Uh, and of course, the city full of homeless people because of the evictions and the destruction of the slums, um, they came in en masse to the clinic. And these became the people that she would call uh, her guests, not patients. And uh, she would direct them to artistic work because she thought that that was the best therapy that could be uh, to uh, give the person the chance of getting into a new equilibrium, a new homeostasis with the social environment. Um, one of the uh, people that benefited from uh, Nisi's uh, method, <coughs> he was not in her clinic, but in a clinic that was based according to her model, was uh, Bispo do Rosario. Uh, and this man, um, uh, just in the, in the previous talk, talking about uh, people with mental imbalance, the idea that they tend to roam the city. Uh, he was someone that used to um, walk over the cities in Rio de Janeiro collecting um, discarded material uh, to be able to use it as uh, the source for his art making. And he will uh, make these fantastic panels with very elaborated, sophisticated embroidery, something just unbelievable. And since he wanted to walk with these things through the streets, he would uh, put wheels into it and uh, all those flags and sails. And whenever he arrived into a neighborhood, it was madness. Everybody would go mad. They would uh, follow uh, the, the little trolley. The, the children, they would put toys into it. They would put dolls into it. They wanted to pull it themselves. It was a celebration. Uh, he was loved by everybody. It was party time when he arrived. And he moved it all over, all over the city, all day long. And he uh, used it to create those incredible mantles and robes. Um, since people uh, asked him to do cleaning service as well, well, why not use it as art work as well? Oh, take a look to that. No <laughs> words to describe, it's just pure poetry. 
Uh, and, and he came to this fantastic bed. It, it, it is a medical bed uh, that was discarded and he found it and he transformed it into this um, fancy, this, this uh, fantasy of, of an imperial bed that he carried all over the city and all of a sudden he was sleeping in the middle of a spare in Rio de Janeiro in this beautiful, wonderful uh, fairy tale bed. Okay, this is Oitzika Filho, um, a scientist, biologist, mathematician, <laughs> father of Elio Oitzika. He knew everything because it, uh, uh, of the cognitive revolution because he worked in the States in the Smithsonian Institute. So he passed it on to, uh, because he was an artist as well, he passed it on to uh, Mario Pedrosa and to Nils Silveira and brought his son into it. Uh, I don't have the time to comment. And the first kind of artwork that Eliud Sika made was this. Um, and it is a labyrinth for ants. You won't find this uh, artwork in any of Eliud's catalogs because most art critics think that this is not art. Uh, this is something that he did when he was working as assistant to his father. But then the idea <coughs> is all the artwork that Eliud Sika ever did in his life is a direct um, uh, spin-off from this ant's labyrinth. Uh, why is it and why is that? I'll leave it as the enigma as I finish here. I will never have time for that. <laughs> we will bring you back. We have to bring you back. We have sequel two, three, four, and five. We have to have you back. It's okay. incredible. Um, I, I'm going to talk about my uh, ethnographic fieldwork on plastic surgery, uh, and plastic surgery has conjured up these dystopic and also utopic scenarios, you know, of a, of a post-human um, cyborg. But I wanted to take a different approach and uh, reflect on this comment that I heard in Rio de Janeiro about the vanity of maids. Um, now, being a, a gringo, of course, the natural place to start is with a Rio de Janeiro samba parade. Um, this is a quote from a Carnival designer who I also hear from one of my informants has had some work done. Um, this is just between friends. This should not be repeated. Um, but while men were very shy about talking about plastic surgery, uh, women and also female celebrities were very open and this is, as you know, I think from Brazilian media, um, there's been a lot of public endorsement of plastic surgery, or simply plastica, as it's called in Brazil. Um, surgeons, though, told me that the most important way uh, to get business is boca a boca. This phrase that means you know, mouth to mouth. Um, referrals happen in the family from the mother to the daughter, or the niece to the aunt, or the cousin uh, to the cousin. Um, some surgeons, though, also told me that they operated on their own family members or wives. Um, Gabriella said that she had gone to her uncle for a breast reduction surgery, and then when the surgery did not go as planned, she had to have the correction from another surgeon, which was really an awkward situation in the family. Um, as we heard yesterday, uh, maids, in a sort of perverse way, are sometimes considered to be members of the family. Um, Mariani and Strosenberg have said that marriage in Brazil is sometimes a relationship between a man and two women, the wife and the maid, the maid being, quote, the other face of the wife. And I think in the context of plastic surgery, this will have a different um, significance. When I was interviewing Dr. Adriano at his home, his empregada, or maid, came in with a tray of coffee and cake. Pointing to her proudly, he said, she used to work for my grandmother, and then when she came to work for me, I did her face, in, in other words, a facelift. Some plastic surgery patients were also impressed by what they called the vanity of maids. Um, Glaucia and her friend talked about how their own empregadas would leave the house after a day of work, produzida uh, or interona, sort of put together. Um, in these comments, um, vaidade or, or vanity 
is not really pejorative. It means something neutral or even positive, like self-care, normal grooming. While these comments seem to narrow the distance between them and the maids, they also seem to feel a kind of amusement at the idea of women of, of low social status doing what they were doing and, and probably also felt that they were some lapses in, in good taste. Um, surgeons, too, also marveled at um, the desires of maids for plastica. And I'll just let you read this. Dr. Hibero is a more senior surgeon, and, and Dr. Afonso is his young, uh, younger student. Now, um, he was wrong about it always being reduction, although that surgery is popular. There is now a, a, what's been called a fashion for breast augmentation. Uh, these comments about the vanity of maids seem to suggest something about the intimate nature of class in Brazil, which I wanted to understand. Why did these maids want plastica, and why on their breast and belly? I first met uh, Esther through her former boss, uh, Dr. Eduardo, a plastic surgeon with a practice in uh, Le Blanc in, in Rio. And Esther worked at his house preparing meals for him and his family. She was not a live-in maid. Uh, she took a bus uh, after work back to her home in Vigigal Favela, which is built on a rocky ridge flanking Le Blanc. And Dr. Eduardo told me of an unusual scene that had happened at his house after Esther had finished her duties she asked him for a word, shyly. Um, it's a medical question, she said. Doctor, I want to put in silicone. He didn't want to do the surgery himself, unlike some of these other surgeons, and referred her to a young resident in the plastic surgery ward of Santa Casa Hospital in downtown Rio. And it was here that Esther uh, obtained breast implants, paying a small fee just for the cost of the implant and anesthesia. The surgeons didn't charge anything. Funded with charity and some state funds, Santa Casa attends patients surgeons call cadence or needy. Every week, throngs of people show up uh, for an orientation leading them through the hospital bureaucracy. Patients um, sometimes camped out overnight, and the hospital did uh, 1,500 operations a year, sometimes with a wait of up to three years. It was a hectic place. Um, Forty residents were there, several surgeon professors, two operation theaters for major surgeries, one for minor. And here are two operations being performed at the same time, which provoked some concerns in an uh, English uh, surgeon who was visiting at the time, but he really marveled at the kind of artisanal skill of the surgeons. Many patients tell me they, they first heard about the hospital from a television story on Ivo Pitangi, who founded the ward in 1962. Pitangi has amassed a personal fortune, but also has accomplishments to arouse the envy of any academic, a handful of honorary doctorates and some 800 publications. He was also elected one of the 10 most important physicians of the 20th century, which places him in the company of Oswaldo Cruz. Um, Pitangi, though, has said that the most important um, or meaningful recognition for him was a carnival parade, um, because it showed that uh, what I do is comprehended by the people. Most of his publications are technical, but some have titles like Philosophical and Psychological Aspects of Plastic Surgery. And they have uh, quotes with, uh, from thinkers uh, such as Levi Strauss, Foucault. In these writings, he has outlined what he, uh, outlined what he calls a humanist vision of plastic surgery as psychological healing. <coughs> in this view, the surgeon is a psychologist with a scalpel in his hand. And many patients uh, spoke in this kind of psychological idiom. Esther said that she was having surgery to raise her autoesteem or self-esteem. A psychologist who uh, gives a test to all patients at Santa Casa to make sure they're ready uh, for surgery shared some of her doubts about their motivations. Um, she worried that they were using surgery as a means to solve other problems. She said, though, that um, psychotherapy was not an option for them, as it was for her wealthier clients. She said the poor prefer surgery. Plastic surgeons, though, also think that their form of healing is the more universal, more effective than talking cures. 
a plastic surgeon said to me, what is the difference between a psychoanalyst and a plastic surgeon? The psychoanalyst knows everything but changes nothing. The plastic <laughs> surgeon knows nothing but changes everything. <laughs> Um, in fact, uh, surgeons do have quite a lot of medical knowledge about the female body and about race. Realizing surgery's healing potential, Pitangi set out on a mission to make it more accessible, claiming that, quote, plastic surgery is not only for the rich, the poor have the right to be beautiful. <laughs> um, okay, this is Pitangi in his office. Now, at one point, um, sort of on the verge of the nervous breakdown that is a rite of passage for anthropologists, um, I called up uh, Joao in despair, and he said, Alex, you know, calm down. <laughs> you just have to try to understand one human being. And I thought, okay, uh, <laughs> this is not too hard. Um, in <laughs> fact, I don't think I really succeeded in that, um, but I did follow his other piece of advice, which was to keep going back to the hospital. So Santa Casa became a field work site, but also other um, fully public hospitals that uh, were not supported by charity, but were in, this, in, in part of the SUS, and which also had not just reconstructive, but free cosmetic surgery. Now, um, these Hospitals um, produce a lot of surgeons, so over 500 have been uh, trained by PTMD, um, and they've moved into the private sector, um, attracting, uh, pushing down prices, attracting tourists and also residents from abroad. Um, and here you see residents discussing uh, before and after photos of a patient on a digital camera. Um, now, in the private sector, there's been this massive growth in Plastica due to cost cutting, the stabilization of inflation, and also financing plans so that you're allowed to pay a little bit per month. Even innovative schemes like consortios for Plastica, uh, Plastica sweepstakes, um, very aggressive uh, <laughs> marketing. Um, also, uh, the endorsement of plastic surgery um, by uh, artistas, models, actresses, Luma Oliveira in this outdoor advertisement, most of whom have had plastic surgery. This is not really the, the girl next door that we saw uh, earlier this morning, I think. Um, also, uh, beauty contestants so have become controversial as spokespeople for uh, Plastica. Um, the Brazilian media, oh sorry, I should also say that they, there's also been this kind of marketing to consumers through these strange magazines, Plastica and Beleza, which are sold, this is something like Plastica and Beauty, um, sold in newsstands next to magazines like Vogue. Um, but the mainstream news media has also been remarkably positive about Plastica. So Veja described Brazil in 2000 as the empire of the scalpel. And Brazil, it is now claimed, is the second largest market for cosmetic surgery in the world after <coughs> um, the US. Now this growth in uh, demand is also, we could say, useful to plastic surgeons. One chief surgeon told me that um, giving free cosmetic surgery was important because the residents needed scientific training. So they said it's really a unified specialty. We can't only have them doing reconstructive surgery. And um, as I said, this attracts residents from all over, mainly Latin America, but other places as well. One resident said he did 96 surgeries in his third year, almost all of them cosmetic. Now this busy schedule um, and sometimes less than ideal conditions in the hospital leads to special opportunities uh, for surgeons. So um, I'll let you read this comment from a senior surgeon. Now, while patients are generally grateful to surgeons, many have repeat surgeries, retokis, kind of touch-ups, um, or they're disappointed. Often, their interactions in the clinic leads them to see new defects. So the surgeon is the expert in beauty and can point out, for example, an asymmetry they didn't know about before. This idea of, of a right to beauty and subsidized cosmetic surgery um, illustrate some of the ironies of health and citizenship we've been talking about here in, in post-dictatorship Brazil 
You have state money uh, supporting a residency program to train surgeons who then go out into the private sector and open much more profitable uh, businesses. Um, and while the patients, of course, are having elective surgery, they're grateful. Um, they also serve as raw material for the surgeon's training. Um, I also want to look at plastic surgery, though, as a window onto changes in how people are searching for belonging, how they're working on the body and the self, um, in a changing therapeutic landscape in Brazil, in what we might call the kind of ruins of psychoanalysis. Surgeons see plastica as a universal means to attain psychological health, um, but in practice, it's often uh, a routine aspect of women's health. So surgeons say plastic surgery is a technique for uh, correcting defects that they link to pregnancy, birth, breastfeeding, and menopause. The sort of moral authorization of cosmetic surgery as healing also happens through its links with other medical specialties, mainly obstetrics and gynecology, also endocrinology. Um, a cosmetic surgery procedure is often just one stage in a longer therapeutic itinerary. I like this word that we heard uh, this morning um, in relation to religious healing. Um, so this journey can also include more cosmetic surgeries, um, elective C-section, cesarean section rather, uh, tubal ligation, as well as sex hormone therapies, all of which occur at high rates in Brazil. And uh, this is a uh, article in Veja magazine talking about uh, feminina estetica, estetica feminina, or medicine, est medicina estetica, this idea that there is a kind of unified field that brings beauty and health together. You see it also even in subfields like aesthetic endocrinology, that's a mouthful. Um, and what happens here, so, uh, and so in this table there's discussion of improvements in breast implants uh, next to discussion of improvements in diagnosing osteoporosis or breast cancer. Um, so um, some obstetricians refer their patients to plastic surgeons, they say as one mother said, her doctor told her, you don't have to look like that after birth, let me call my friend. Right, so it's often this kind of friendly referral. Um, plastic surgery is recommended as a means to correct scars or flaccidity that they uh, link to C-section. Um, those women who do not give birth via C-section are sometimes given postpartum vaginal cosmetic surgery in public hospitals according to um, the work of my collaborator, anthropologist Emilia Sanabria, who did field work in Bahia. And she argues that OBGYNs offer these cosmetic surgeries as a kind of, quote, proxy for the cesarean sections that are so common among middle and upper class women. Other women, though, um, view cosmetic surgery as a means to uh, compensate for the iatric iatrogenic damage caused by other surgery. Plastic surgery becomes a compensation to the self or a kind of gift, as surgeons often uh, said. So with these points in mind, I want to return to the comments about maids. Afonso said they want surgery on the belly and breast, and always a reduction. One might read this desire um, as pointing to a particular beauty norm for women in Brazil, which favors relatively smaller breasts. This norm, together with more emphasis on other parts of the body, on uh, wide hips, for example, and round thighs, uh, Michael Hanchard has argued is an Afro-Brazilian cultural legacy, and in is in any case an ideal seen in Brazilian pop culture, or at least it was until it was said to be threatened by this new trend for uh, breast implants, which um, actually raised the specter of cultural imperialism, according to the Brazilian media, uh, on, and not you know questions about women's health as it did in the United States. Okay, uh, I'm going to skip. I'll just briefly. This is out of order, but this is the uh, chip da beleza, which is a kind of hormonal implant, which is used, uh, which is prepared by. Um, compounding pharmacies, 
and which includes not just estrogen, but hormones like testosterone, and which is used not just for contraception, but to uh, regulate libido, to control menstrual periods. It has even aesthetic effects, hence the, the beleza, the beauty, um, and that it's used for, for weight loss or to change elasticity of the skin. Very controversial, and this, I should also say, <coughs> comes from the work of Amelia Sanabria. Okay, so this, this beauty norm is here, uh, is emulated by travestis uh, who focus on injecting liquid silicone in the lower parts of their bodies and also taking sex hormones. Um, now this, this kind of beauty work is seen as a kind of um, street plastica, a vulgar plastica, which is not the same as the medically legitimate and considered safe um, uh, cosmetic surgery. Um, women, though, have also injected liquid silicone, as I've just mentioned, take uh, sex hormones in experimental regimes. Um, and I've, in public hospitals, the surgeons are sometimes dismayed at patients who present with silicone that's hardened in the face or body and which has to be removed. Surgeons, though, did not racialize breast reduction. They did, though, often speak of what they called miscegenation claiming that they worked with a unique population. And I, I don't have space to go into detail here, um, but I think the plastic surgery ward was also a kind of laboratory of races. Surgeons said, for example, that they could, through lipo escultura, or a kind of fat sculpting, emulate what they said were the good effects of African-European mixing on the female body. So they could use this to um, move fat from the abdomen and the, uh, this area down below. <laughs> they also said that miscegenation um, creates disharmonies, though, body parts that don't match and which they can correct with their surgical technique. And um, they also use plastic surgery to lighten or whiten um, faces in operations that are called correction of the negroid nose. Um, demand for plastic surgery on the body may also reflect a desire for a medical good being normalized among upper social strata. More subtly, it may reflect desires to have a body unmarked by denigrated labor, both menial domestic labor and to some extent reproductive labor. So motherhood was valorized by patients um, but a maternal body that has not been properly managed with modern medicine could be seen as largada or, or not properly taken care of. <coughs> In recent years, maids have politically organized. Um, we've been talking about this a little bit um, here today. According to The Economist, a, a booming economy in Brazil has led to a new complaint being uttered in cities like Rio and Sao Paulo. Uh, good help is hard to find. For many women whose mothers and grandmothers and aunts worked as maids, though, domestic work remains a default life path and a fate to be escaped. Esther left high school at 16 to work beside her mom as a maid during a difficult time in the family. Now a single mom herself, she takes night classes, hoping to finish high school, and even takes a long bus ride to do a cheap um, college class in admin. She says she wants to do anything but, quote, work with the family and dreams of, she said, working with numbers. For many um, uh, women in public hospitals, um, the most viable and often desirable mode of escape is via work in Brazil's thriving service economy. So patients I talked to often worked as service workers, waitresses, vendors, secretaries. And in service work, traits such as color, youth, attractiveness can sort of add value to the interaction or become hiring criteria. Alini worked um, handing out Gatorade, cups of Gatorade on the beach, and she was hired piecemeal, so it wasn't a steady job. There was a kind of selection made, and she said, uh, we are selected, quote, by the body. The better I am, I'll have a return on that. So in service interactions, the worker is sort of part of the product or service, and it suggests that attractiveness can be seen as a form of capital that is traded in labor markets, 
but also in what women refer to as the market of <coughs> namorandu or dating. Flavia at age 26 said, quote, a 40-year-old is in the market competing with a 20-year-old because of the technology of plastic surgery. Referring to the same age gap, Valeria said women of one woman of 40 was being traded for two of 20. Other patients spoke of an epidemic of separations or trisau cheating or a lack of interesting men. Uh, Zilia, a middle class plastica patient in her early 60s, said that she and her peers were climbing up the hill, that is, to favelas. And her friend with her asked why. And she said, La nautem brocha, nautem bisha, y now importa ficar com mulher velha. Which means something like, there is no impotence, there are no gays, they don't mind being with old women. Now, whether plastica actually makes people look younger or more attractive is an open question, and there have been some medical studies, I don't know how they actually measure this, that show that there isn't that much change in the perception of appearance after a facelift, for example. But while attractiveness is undemocratically allocated, it can also grant power to those excluded from other systems of privilege based in wealth or education. While boys living in poverty often dream of becoming pro athletes, many girls have the equally impossible dream of becoming fashion models. In both fantasies, the invisibility of being poor is negated by the physicality of the body, either through the sort of super masculine um, soccer player or the super feminine supermodel. Um, in Brazil's urban peripheries, there are many dreams centered on uh, the body. NGOs like Lens of Dreams in City of God Favela in Rio offer free lessons in fashion modeling along with lessons in citizenship. As we heard um, earlier today, powerful attractions that cross class lines are a favorite theme in telenovelas. And popular classes, as surgeons say, are struggling to economize or, other, or face long lines at public hospitals to have cosmetic surgery. These social facts stem from a lack of other opportunities, but they also reflect an accurate, not diluted perception of the importance of attractiveness in consumer capitalism. Beauty can be a form of capital that can potentially be exchanged for other benefits, however small, transient, or unconducive to collective change. And I'll just conclude with one final small point. Um, so I think these comments about the vanity of maids show the complexity of social aspirations in a media and consumption-based social order. The struggle for belonging entails not just the exercise of formal rights and citizenship, but also a more intimate struggle to attain a kind of modern femininity. Vanity is not an ahistorical moral quality. Um, but the apparent vanity of consuming plastica reflects a desire to attain a medical good that is being uh, normalized in women's reproductive and sexual health care. Plastica may be a vanity, but for Esther, she said, it was <coughs> necessary. Thank you. I thank the organizers for having the chance and the privilege to dialogue with Alexander Edmonds and Nikolaus Sevichenko. Uh, I will start with Sevichenko, following the order of the panel. Uh, first of all, Sevichenko, many, many, many thanks for your presentation. I think that uh, you gave to all the, 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 the scholars here present a clear sense of uh, your work, which always combine, combines a refined scholarship and a critical imagination. It is not an easy task, actually, <laughs> to comment your lecture, because you had so many insightful and fruitful questions. But I will try, uh, for the benefit of the audience, I will try not to synthesize, but to approach your lecture recalling one of your groundbreaking books, Orfeu Estático na Metrópole. Because in Orfeu Estático na Metrópole, if I followed you correctly, you have the same method, which now you have deepened and radicalized. In Orfeu Estático na Metrópole, you start discussing te technological changes and innovations, very much as you did today. And then you, you showed 
how these changes and innovations propitiated the new experiences of cities, how the experience of the urban space was dramatically <coughs> impacted and changed by the technological changes and innovations. And finally, in Ofeu Estatico na Metrópole, you then analyzed very insightfully how the Brazilian avant-garde, as you say in Brazil, o modernismo brasileiro, how the Brazilians avant-garde dialogued with and interact with the new exper experience of city as well as with technological innovations, innovations and changes. If I followed you correctly, you just presented the same model for our refle reflection. You started with a brilliant and synthetic view of Norbert Wiener, Alan Turing, Claude Chanon, uh, Warren Weaver, Prigogine, Buckminster Fuller, Marshall McLuhan, Rachel Carson, Edward Wilson, Jamie J Jacobs, and then Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, you started with the technological innovations, how they impacted the perception of the cities, and then that would be the, your, the second part of a lecture when you brought Buckminster's, Buckminster Fuller to our discussion. And by the way, we have a fascinating architect in Brazil, usually not well appreciated. He's well known as Lele, and he has tried to bring to Brazil certain of these structures of Buck Mr. Buck Mr. Fuller. And then you came to Brazil. So let's see if you would agree if uh, I propose the following for your first part, which I thought was theoretically a fascinating presentation of a main problem. If I, if I understand correctly, actually, you are proposing a new paradigm for this conference. You are proposing a new paradigm of, to understand cities. So in the first part, your main problem seems to be, or your main contribution, seems to be the synthesis of a series of very important thinkers, innovative thinkers, that perhaps we could synthesize or bring together the reflections with the concept of self-poetic systems. This concept proposed by the biologists Francisco Varela and Humberto Maturano, Maturana, who also, also came, up, came up with the most concise and brilliant definition of emergence. Emergence takes place when two systems, when, when the coupling of two systems produces an outcome which could not be predicted by the systems themselves seen isolatedly. Actually, there, was a, there were two socio sociologists, but above all a German sociologist, who already tried to bring together all these, these new, uh, these innovative concepts through the systems theory, Nicholas Luhmann. And also Luhmann, uh, in his theory, the foundation of Luhmann's theory was not only Varela and Maturana, but also a mathematician called Spencer Brown, who has a very thin but fascinating book called Laws of Form. And by the combination of both, Luhmann proposed the, that modernity was above all the coupling of different social systems, but to Luhmann, the coupling of the social systems had as a main function reduction of complexity. So to Luhmann, the function of the system is to produce a reduction of complexity. And if this model is a very interesting model to think of the modern world, I believe that uh, what you are proposing, what you, what you are trying to develop, is a model more interesting than the model that Luhmann proposes. Also bringing together so natural sciences, Math mathematics and social sciences. So if you understand correctly, this is your project. Because in your project, or in your reflection, actually, if you understand correctly, and that I come to the second part, that started with Buck, Must Buck Mr. Fuller, and when you brought your reflection to the cities, if I understand correctly, what you're trying to tell us is that actually system theory should not be about reduction of complexity, but rather to understand cities today we have to work in the increasing of complexities. And therefore, we're not going to found, found, find a healthy or a balanced city. I think that you proposed a fascinating way of seeing this through the concept of homeostatic. So cities are, if I follow you correctly, historically epidemic. They cannot but produce higher and higher levels of, of complexities. And therefore, cities can only be homeostatic. In other words, you are proposing to us, if I followed you, you are proposing to us a new paradigm to understand cities. Cities would be a perfect example of emergence. And then cities should occupy a fundamental role in the emergency studies, as you propose. Then we come to Brazil, your final part. Uh, it is... 
What? Yeah, <laughs> the, <laughs> the third part of what we of what we we saw. It's fascinating to think that uh, Carlos Lacerda, in his urban po policies, created this most well-known slum in Brazil, which is not uh, Rocinha, is is Cidade de Deus. The city of God was created by Carlos Lacerda, and the irony, of course, does not escape us, especially if we think about the circumstances in which St. Augustine wrote The City of God, the book. And it seems to me that uh, by bringing, bringing by, at the end, Mario Pedrosa, Elio Chisica, I also thought of Ligia Clark, you are, showing us, you are showing us a perfect example of art as emergence. Not only Elio Chisica's Parangolés, if you do not know Parangolés by Elio, Elio Chisica and Ligia Clark, were one of the most innovative plastic artists of the 20th century. I'm not saying Brazilian 20th century, the 20th century. And most of, of their work, I just realized through your presentation, can actually be seen as a sort of an anticipation of what you call emerge, or of what we call emergency studies. I'm thinking especially of Parangolés. Parangolés was a custom. The, 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 the work of art actually was not the work of art, was the interaction with the beholder. The beholder sees it to be a beholder, would have to dress the custom, and the art would be the body moving and dancing. And then the clothes would get different shapes. Ligia Clark has just this incredible invention, which she calls os bichos, the beasts. They are metal plates that uh, they, they stand up through, due, due to homeostatic circumstance. They have an equilibrium. And actually, the main goal of the bichos is that the beholder, again, ceases to be a beholder. You have to touch the bichos. And so the metal plates move. And by moving, they achieve another homeostatic moment. If so, uh, Nikolaus Savichenko, if you agree with this brutal synthesis of your work, then we know why you ended what you could tell us with the image of Elwood Sika's Ants Labyrinth. It's the same image of Claude Shannon's that you showed us. It's the labyrinth as an invisible chess game. A chess game which has never ends, because there isn't in this chess game checkmate. So I would have two or three questions for Sevichenko. The first one, are you proposing us that cities, cities should be reread as models for emergence? So instead of healthy cities, are you, are you proposing to us that cities were, so to speak, or cities have always already been readers of Prigogine's work? In other words, cities are the model of order out of chaos. And if you could, you, I, you started to raise some criticisms on Brazilian modern urbanism, but then you didn't have the time to develop. If you could just develop a bit more, if I understood correctly, there was a sort of criticism on the Brazilian modern urbanism, the Brazilian modern urbanism. And once more, I thank you for this insightfully and brilliant lecture, which actually shows that there is always an exception to the rule. You told us when you, when you began that uh, academics or universities do not like very, very brilliant people. You are an exception. You are very, very brilliant, and we love your lecture. <laughs> now let me propose uh, questions to Alexander Edmond as well. Once more, I, I thank you. I, I, th I, I think your lecture was very thought-provoking. And I think it revealed to us Brazilians certain aspects which to us they are not so clear. And I just started reading your book, and I do hope that soon it gets published in Brazil. Uh, the title of your lecture actually caught my attention, The Vanity of Maids. Because there is something very peculiar about Brazil. The builders in Brazil, and probably have seen that, the builders in Brazil, they always have two elevators, the social and the maids elevator. The main difference is not the size. The main difference is that the maid's elevator never, the maid's elevators never have mirror. They cannot look at themselves. They are invisible to themselves. So if I understood correctly your presentation, it seems to me that you are proposing to us that uh, plastic surgery in Brazil has a new dimension. And this is one of the questions whether you confirm that. The new dimension would be not only self-esteem, 
as a sort of a personal self-esteem or as a psychological healing, as you mentioned. But plastic surgery in Brazil, especially with the class C that uh, you referred to, has become a sign of social distinction. In other words, plastic surgery is not only psychological healing, but above all, a sign of social distinction. And if you agree with that, I just read last week in a Brazilian newspaper, O Globo, that the latest fashion among the cariocas, street vendors, probably you saw them in the streets in Rio, os camelôs, that the latest fashion is the best-selling item. There are faked braces. But above all, they are colorful braces. So why is it that you would buy fake braces, colorful ones? Because on Monday, you can use a braces of red braces. On Tuesday, you can use a green ones, so forth and so on. But the, the question, I think, that they all work help us to help, help me to understand this phenomenon, this contemporary phenomenon, is that actually having braces in Brazil 30 years ago was very expensive, was a long, painful, and expensive treatment. Actually, just the upper classes could have braces and dental treatment. So now, when braces have become aesthetic, they are not aesthetic. They are a sign of, they are a sign of social distinction. So I would have some questions for you, following this, uh, this perception, this understanding of your lecture. Uh, it seems that perhaps what you're telling us is that uh, aesthetic medicine in Brazil for the class C, as you have shown us, is above all a politics of plastic surgery. And this politics, and then, then I ask you three questions, but they are related. This, this if you agree that, that the pl plastic surgery has become a sign for social distinction, I ask you, is this unique to Brazil? Or you have seen the same phenomenon, let's say, in the BRIC countries, in the countries with an emerging uh, middle class? How does this, how, the, how, the, how is it different from the American model? For instance, you mentioned the growing number of surgeries regarding augmentation of breasts. It does not seem to be the traditional aesthetic pattern in Brazil to have augmentation of breasts. How do you see that? Is it sort of an importation of an American model or not necessarily? So once more, thank you for your lecture. I think that helped us to understand new dimensions of plastic surgery in Brazil. Uh, I, I had to start by uh, thanking John Sally for his uh, incredible comments that uh, made me uh, rethink uh, everything that I just said. Uh, in many <laughs> because um, yeah, um, um, I, I have these uh, people that you mentioned, uh, particularly Vanelli Maturana, that is uh, my main inspirators. I, I, I have a passion for their work and the way they um, see. Um, not just uh, living organisms, but uh, social organisms, as uh, according to this emerging uh, model. And uh, the dynamic that they always look for is this dynamic coming from the bottom up. Uh, and in that sense, uh, what comes is the uh, micro dynamics <coughs> uh, at the lower level of the structure. Um, it is amazing because um, you know it very well. If you go back in history, uh, you will see um, in other cultures, in even in great classical, uh, great culture, <coughs> elements of this way of thinking. Uh, the um, strange thing with Western culture is why it, uh, at some stage, disappeared completely. And then we were kind of uh, had our minds monopolized by one single system, one single way of thinking. Um, and why is it? Um, uh, what, what strikes me about the Cold War is that uh, it, you can think of it as, uh, as more like the beginning of a um, game of billiards. When you strike one ball and you split uh, all the other uh, ones uh, that go running uh, upon the table. Uh, and you cannot predict uh, where is it that they are going to go. But, uh, I think that's what is particular about that moment, because it wasn't planned. 
uh, the war wasn't planned. Uh, people didn't realize that it was all going to happen. All that technology came before people could think about them, before people could think what to do uh, with that technology. Uh, and then for a while, it, it was kind of uh, wild technology <coughs> without anybody's uh, direct control. Until then, eventually, yeah, it got the direction. It became uh, especially controlled by the military and the um, security um, apparatus. And in that sense, uh, nowadays, what at one moment looked so promising, nowadays looks so threatening. And if you think of mathematics nowadays, it gives you the creeps. Because it's used for social control more than anything else. Uh, if you think about that model by which the um, security agencies in the United States can control uh, anybody in this planet uh, through their uh, electronic devices, their little electronic devices. Everybody is under direct control in a way that was never before possible. And that is like this because of this uh, uh, pandemonium model that was so promising when Shane of uh, showed us for the first time or so incredible when uh, Prigogine made of it a new way of thinking about nature, uh, or when uh, Wilson used it to uh, understand the ants' colony. But nowadays, no, it's all about control. It's all about uh, uh, getting people into a network that is not more a network of possibilities, but a network of enclosure, uh, of, of, of um, limiting possibilities, limiting ways of thinking, limiting alternatives to get uh, out of it. And that uh, godlike model that seemed to be uh, finished once and for all is again more powerful than ever. And that's the reason why I like to think about this, th this moment, the, the 60s and the 50s, because everything was open. The horizon was open. Nobody knew what was going to be made out of it. And the best things could have been made of, uh, uh, out of it. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't uh, finish it, but uh, uh, the entire Chilean experience, uh, the government uh, of uh, Allende, was completely um, articulated as a, 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 as a um, uh, what, what's the name? I, I'm dyslexic. Uh, Sometimes. <laughs> Chilean experience. No, no, no. Uh, 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 Oh, my goodness, I'm talking about it. Um, cybernetics. It was uh, modeled according to a cybernetic system uh, by a brilliant uh, systems engineer, um, a mathematician, a British one, called uh, Stafford Beer. He created this uh, incredible system by which uh, all decisions taken at the top were simultaneously in real time being followed by people all over Chile, in all <coughs> uh, the different communities, the cities and the rural areas, so that people could inter interact in real time with the decisions being taken and take part uh, in the way uh, or in the direction that those decisions were being taken. This is radical direct democracy in a way that was never practiced before. This is cybernetics conceived as a way of liberating people and reconfigurating what is democracy in a way that go far beyond what the Greeks ever could conceive of, out of it. And this is possible thanks to technology, that same technology that today put us so much under control, under surveillance um, in a state that is um, a condition by which all of us uh, feel unsafe mm -hmm. as opposed to safe. We feel that somehow we are suspects of, of, of something. Uh, we, we have to prove that we uh, are not going to do uh, the things that people think that we are going to do. That's amazing. Uh, you, you live in fear. Uh, and and uh, the system that was created to potentialize, to empower uh, people in social terms, in democratic terms, is nowadays uh, used uh, the other way around. But then again, uh, is everything lost? Uh, no, I think that uh, what happened in the 50s and 60s is it's still there. And if you revisit it, you can Relive it 
you, you can somehow uh, reconnect it to it and you can perhaps uh, use it as uh, the instrument, as the uh, resource that you will bring to uh, present day uh, political uh, dialogue in terms of uh, bringing forth a new democratic uh, model or a new model of a city. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm stopping here. Uh, thank you so much for these comments. Um, yes, I, I love this, this remark about the uh, maze elevator, the service elevator, which I've, you know, like many of you, have taken. I never noticed this, so I need to be a more observant anthropologist. Um, reminded me of the, of the law, I think, in the Philippines that prohibits domestic workers from wearing lipstick, the sort of bizarre regulation. Um, and I think it suggests that there is something disturbing about the notion of having a, a domestic worker or another woman integrated into the intimate routine of the house. And, and this sort of suggests a kind of splitting of, of femininity or of roles of women in the house. And, um, and that's what I tried to suggest with, with the talk. Um, I, I didn't want to uh, imply, however, that, that sort of all maids in Brazil are, are having plastic surgery. Um, I don't know, you know I, I haven't done a survey of maids, but maids, I mean, the figure of the maid, the empregada, can often be kind of stand in for uh, working class women because it's such a prevalent occupation in Brazil. Um, so I was also talking about the rise of plastic surgery um, or the accessibility of plastic surgery um, beyond the middle class and beyond the elite, um, either through um, public hospitals, um, but also through credit plans and um, this kind of intense competition between surgeons, which is driving down um, prices. So these graduates of these programs are moving out into the interior of Brazil. The state of Minas Gerais has uh, more plastic surgeons, in fact, than the state of Rio de Janeiro, and there, there are many in, in Sao Paulo uh, as well. Um, I really have struggled with this question of, of social distinction. I think that um, it's tricky with plastic surgery. I can't. I don't think we can see it simply as as conspicuous consumption. Um, there's a lot going on there, and of course, the the <coughs> effects of plastic surgery should be invisible. So these, at least, plastic surgeons say that this kind of what they call the Park Avenue look, this kind of very stretched face or the unnatural looking breasts, you know, that, that, that's passe, that's out. And you don't want, you don't want the marks to be visible. Um, but I'm not sure that's entirely true. And I, I think patients did, um, were very happy to talk about their surgery, to even show it off to strangers in the hospital. And the waiting rooms are very social places, so groups of women would be discussing what they had previously. Um, so there is a kind of pride taken in being able to have acquire this, this operation. Um, but I, you know, I think plastic surgery is maybe like other areas of health care now, but especially so, um, straddles consumer society and and health healthcare, and it's it's a commodity, but it's it's not only that. Um, it also sort of is being um, demand for it comes from consumer culture, comes from these celebrities who have publicly endorsed it, comes from telenovelas that have featured episodes on plastic surgery. And so part of it is about beauty, which really is not a medical domain. And part of it is about women's health care, about psychological healing, and, and sort of involves medical expertise. And so it's, it's a very uneasy hybrid, or a, a, an unstable hybrid, I should say. Um, there is a question about whether this was a, a long-term therapy. And I think one of the things that is really disturbing about this practice is that it is being uh, integrated into the life course, especially for women. So it's not, it's not a one-off thing. So I was really struck during field work by how many patients said that they had repeat operations. So I you know, soon learned to ask that question right away, sort of take a whole history of the kinds of surgical interventions they've had, both in reproductive health care <coughs> in plastic surgery. So, and the patients I talked to really range from across the age spectrum, from teenagers to uh, women in their 60s, and, but women and, and men in their 70s and 80s have also had plastic surgery. 
And so they, they were able to reflect back on, on their operations. And they often would time them to key um, social and, and sort of biological events in their life. So getting married, getting divorced, having children. I mean, surgeons even say that the onset of menstruation is the time when uh, you count when the patient becomes ready for plastic surgery. So whether it's three years or four years, and in public hospitals, I, I saw you know, mothers and teenagers together, and, and plastic surgery was a gift to the teenage um, daughter. So it's, it, it's, it's becoming sort of integrated uh, into passage uh, through the life course. Um, if I may. Yes, please. The question about um, the uh, possible oppositions between Sao Paulo and Rio, Brazil and the States. Yeah. Uh, can you? No, 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 and that, I mean, that is an important question, I think, because, of course, uh, Rio has this very famous or infamous uh, cult bikini. of the body, right? I'm sorry? Uh, because of the beach and bikini. Because of the beach and then the beach, yeah. Um, and I think, I think that does play a role, but I, 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 as I said, there are high rates of surgery also in other states. And I think that points to the fact that this is not just about display of the body, um, but it also is being you know, morally authorized as therapy because it's seen as normal health care, whether it's psychological or, or women's health care. Um, with the U.S., you know, I, I think it's, I, I, it's always a risky thing to do comparisons in anthropology when you have ethnography and then you're comparing it to media discourse or, or other studies. Um, I mean, surgeons at least say that there are important differences, so they stress that they have, as I mentioned, this unique population due to all of the mixing um, in Brazil, the racial mixing. And they say it's, it is different here than in Europe or the United States. And uh, they talk, for example, about the fact that they don't know um, which patient will have a keloid scar, right? So a thick, a thick scar. And, um, and normally, or in other types of surgery, this really doesn't matter so much because there's a health benefit. With heart surgery, you <coughs> don't care about keloid scars so much. Um, with aesthetic surgery, of course, they matter because they, they ruin the whole uh, purpose of the surgery. And they said that uh, patients who have some African ancestry um, have this keloid scar on average more often, but they said they don't know, so they can't look at the patient and know um, whether the patient is black or not. And, and so they do this technique of making a practice decision to see, test how the patient um, will scar in advance. Um, and, you know, so this really reminded me of some of the conversations we've been, we've been having here about the visibility of, of race and color and this uh, kind of tension between um, color as a fluid uh, trait and race defined more biologically through ancestry. I think both of them are tensions between them are present in, in plastic surgery works in a way that maybe is not so true in the United States where you've had this other discussion about plastic surgery being a form of passing um, or being a form of uh, ethnic homogenation, which is problematic. And uh, some patients at least would say that, well, I don't, I don't identify as black. I may have some African ancestry, but I'm morena. And if I have this surgery, I'm not, I'm not changing my race. Um, I'm just moving around in this kind of fluid color system. And uh, surgeons didn't see that as a problem, but they also admitted that this was really also a form of whitening in the sense that patients always wanted to move in the direction of Europe. 